Hello, this is Michael Denon, Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and Dean of the Division of Undergraduate Education here at UC Irvine. And this is Conversations with the Vice Provost. This is where I sit down, chat with people about a range of issues that I think are of importance to the UCI community, our state, the nation, and hopefully the world at large. And today I have the pleasure of talking with Dean Song Richardson, second dean of the law school. Song, welcome. It's Thank great you. to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So what I'd like to start off with, our law school is kind of unique in a number of ways. Um, first of all, and when it was created, how new it is, being within the UC system. Yes. But what fascinates me most is the idea of being created around the idea of social justice. Maybe say a little bit about that and then I'll ask you some follow-up questions. Absolutely. Yes, so we began because we wanted not only to be um, the premier law school when it came to, to teaching and when it came to our research, but also because many of our founding faculty and our founding dean cared a lot about social justice. And by social justice, uh, all we mean by that is people should be treated equally and should also have access to equal opportunities and equal resources. Right. And I think that's something that all of us should care about as a community. That seems obvious. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I love it. Yes. Do you guys run into the, I mean, one of the things in our public discourse is often words get co-opted. Yes. And I feel like social justice, often in the public discourse, mm -hmm. tends to carry a connotation of liberal. Interesting. Sometimes. Yes. And it depends on the circles. Sure. Is that something the law school has had to run into, deal with, mm -hmm. think about, or do enough people get it the way you just described it that it's not really an issue? Ah, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm certain that there probably are people right. who view social justice as being a liberal issue. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I don't think it has to be that way, right? Yeah. I think that all of us care about that, about equality, about treating people fairly, about ensuring that people have equal access to the opportunities right. that exist. So despite whether others might try to co-opt it, um, I, I think it's something that speaks to all of us. Now, I'm going to ask you a, a perhaps dangerous question. Okay. Right. I like danger, so let's do <laughs> so, it. So, <laughs> sometimes, now I say this with full disclosure that my brother's a lawyer. Okay. Sometimes lawyers get a bad rap. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, Is that no, true? sometimes I, I don't understand that. And I, I thought physicists get a bad rap. We do, for okay. being very arrogant. All right. But is there, I, I think this is an exciting sort of, um, marketing is too strong of a word, but connection for people to make. Because I would think, at the end of the day, most lawyers go into it for exactly these reasons. And so to make it explicit mm -hmm. that the school is about this fairness and justice and equity kind of helps, I think, counteract maybe some negative impressions people often get from lawyers, whether it's from TV or media or other places. Mm -hmm. Do you get any feedback from the students or the, or the community around this? Are they excited around this idea of social justice, which I think they would be? I, I think so. And, and, and when we speak about social justice, I, I think the law school is actually even broader than that. So social justice is a very important component of what we believe in at the right. law school. But public service, I think, would more accurately describe yeah. how we view ourselves. And, and, and once again, I think this focus on public service it really doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. It really doesn't matter what field of law you want to go into, right? right. This is a core value that we pride ourselves on and our students and faculty and staff also pride themselves on. And with that, I like that. The public service idea, we're starting to have graduates. Yes. How, how are they, I assume they're finding, I mean, I know how well we're ranked and I know how yes. well we're viewed. How are, are you getting feedback already from our graduates of maybe some of the advantages or ways being at UCI, this kind of unique new law school, public service, a lot of the focus on it, how that's kind of shaped where they've gone in their careers yet? So with our students, the both in terms of the jobs that they do, and, and they do a wide variety right. of, of different types of jobs, they feel like we, like I've said earlier, that public service is just important. And especially being at a public school, like the right. University of California, it fits with the broader mission of the university. Uh, when it comes to our students, there's more though that, that make them uh, different right. from other students. And that's because we also pride ourselves on teaching our students 
the practical skills they need to be able to hit the ground running the moment they enter okay. their jobs. And we right. continue to hear that in the community. Um, our, our students are coveted uh, awesome. by public interest and private law firms because they are so practice ready when they get there. And that's one of the things we distinguish ourselves. Is there some tricks to that that you do? Is it how you teach them? Is it the courses you're giving them? That uh, it's really a combination of, okay. of all of that. So right. we are uh, a school that requires every single one of our students to participate in a legal clinic. Okay. And essentially what that means is they represent actual clients while they're in law school. That's one way that they learn how to be a lawyer before they're actually yeah. a lawyer. Um, and there's a lot in our curriculum where we do that. We provide our students with opportunities to get real hands-on experience be before they ever graduate. So that's one of the ways that we're able to prepare our students. Awesome. Do they have um, a good sense? So for me, when I hear public service, yes. which I really like as an image for our law school. Mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously, I think of it very broadly being sort of outside the law. There's lots of ways, like you mentioned, Absolutely. you can do it in a private firm, you can do it in government. Exactly. Obviously public defense exactly. is, a, is a way. Yes. I assume our students are really excited about all those dimensions. They are, that's what's exciting yeah. about it, right? Because I, I think often people mistake public service for a certain type of job. Right. Um, and part of my mission in, in this next five years is, is to broaden that because our students are broader than just public interest. Public interest right. is important, but it's that mindset, right? It's that ability and desire to give back to the community that's already given so much both to the school and to them. Now, how many of them, so I deal with the undergraduates, yes. and we know over half of them change their major, <laughs> right, in their four years here. They're 17, 18. You know, by the time they're coming to you in law school, how many of them really know what type of law they want to do? I mean, it, and, and law school is even shorter. It's three years, right, right if I understand this right. right. Um, and how much, how much do you see them moving and discovering new things and being flexible? Because I think for some of our undergrads, that's a useful piece of information right. to have. So, so what's interesting is, and, and it varies by class and by, right. by student, but there are a lot of students who think, just like I did when I was a law student, that think they know exactly what it is that they want to do. Right. And, and some of them actually do that at the yeah. end, uh, yeah. but many of them, including me when I was in law school, and this is what I tell the students, even if you think you know, take a wide variety of classes, even right. classes you think you have zero interest in because you never know, right? That right. you might find that passion in tax law when you thought you were gonna be a public <laughs> defender, right? Yeah. So you just, you really, you just never know. And so I try to, to tell them my own story about, about that and encourage them just to try a lot Excellent. of different things. Well, good. That'll help students because I think I've noticed students these days, so many of them think there has to be one right path. Exactly. Yes. And exactly. to know that your life can meander. Exactly. It's just really helpful for yes, them. Yes, I, I completely agree. So switching topics. All right. And speaking of you yes. and meandering, <laughs> I, I have to share. So I've heard, you know, as an administrator, you have to go to many different trainings. Yes. Right, and different things. And I heard you speak, I hope this is right at the CEO Roundtable. Yes. A number of years Th ago. That's right. On implicit bias. Yes. And I was very impressed. Thank you. One of the things I liked about it, and I'm going to get, is I felt you understood where your audience would be and was coming from. Mm -hmm. And so it really helped give a nice twist to the talk. Um, and you must have to talk about this a lot to lots of different audiences. Um, for those who are already lost because I've used a word they don't know what it is, yes. first tell us a little bit implicit unconscious bias. What is it? What got you into it? Um, so unconscious bias refers to the way that our brains work. Right, so our brains are like computers. It's, our brains do a lot of things in the background that we're not even aware that they're doing. And just like computers or artificial intelligence mm -hmm. actually, it learns from the inputs that it gets. Yeah. So our brains begin to make unconscious associations that they learn just from reading the paper, right? right? Just from watching TV. So one of those unconscious associations that we develop is we learn what different races mean. Okay. So for instance, blacks are associated with criminality. Right. Asians are associated with math and science, right? We right. just, so we know those stereotypes. 
I'm, by the way, black and Korean, just so, right, yeah. <laughs> just so that's clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always say people will get confused because they don't know, their yeah. unconscious brain is confused about what to do with me, right? So, um, uh, but I have these unconscious biases because I've learned these associations. And although I disagree with them completely, our brains don't care about that, right? right? They just learn these things through constant exposure. Yeah. Uh, so I took a, a test called the Implicit Association Test that's supposed to give us access to our unconscious. And I realized that despite the fact um, that I was a civil rights lawyer and I right. view myself as being very egalitarian consciously, I had these unconscious biases that most people have. So I wanted to understand why I did because it can influence our behaviors and our judgments. And that's why I, I started down this road of research. Now a place that's very um, sort of close to what I do is, and, and, I, and I know a little bit of the research on is of course in science. Yes. There is a lot of research on unconscious bias towards women. Yes. And that's been pretty well established. Yes. And, and what always fascinated me is, as you just shared, mm -hmm. both men and women have it. Exactly. Right? It's not men being biased against women. It's kind of what our brains have learned, that's unfortunately. Right. Yes. Um, so, and that clearly has direct impact to people's lives because mm -hmm. it, it comes into tenure and promotion. It right. comes into evaluating papers exactly. and grants. I would think in law, though, it's probably even more dramatic. Um, not to discount what's happening mm -hmm. in science, because obviously that's critical and important. Mm -hmm. Um, but it seems to me sometimes the stakes might even be higher in like criminal cases and in law. Yes. You know, just right. No, and, that, and that's why. Absolutely. So I assume if it's that's a criminal part case. of your connection from that, studying this from the law side. That is, um, okay. and, and uh, as you may know, I was a former federal right, and yeah. state public defender myself, and so in terms of the impact on someone's actual life, if people are making decisions based on their unconscious biases, it it, it can it can literally be a life and death decision. So I So work are with. there things, you know, mm -hmm. I mean I feel like on some of the issues in science, right, where, you know, we could possibly help some of this by doing better at blind review mm -hmm. exactly. and really not knowing. And, exactly. and 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 in our review of things like cases and yes. papers and proposals, yes. you can think about those as being much easier to make blind. Right. Because of the and nature of it. Way of doing, yes. And that's one way of doing yes. it. I would imagine that's a little harder in like a trial situation or a trial case. Yes. Are there things that people are looking at in the justice system to sort of mitigate this? There are, and I'm working um, with a group in Seattle of, of judges and prosecutors, defense lawyers, and civil lawyers to figure out what we can do within the courtroom right. to try to mitigate some of the influence of an unconscious bias on jury decision making and on judge decision making. Okay. So when it comes to judges, for instance, there are judges now who are blinding themselves to the particular defendant in a criminal case oh, that they're okay. sentencing. Um, so there are things you can do when you take the science seriously. So they'll remove the photo so they don't know who it is before they make the sentencing decision. They'll remove any references in the reports that they get to race or proxies for race. Okay. Then they'll make a decision. And then when the defendant comes in, if they find themselves revisiting that decision, that's a sign to them, right? Yeah, right? Exactly. That maybe unconscious bias is influencing me either to do something more favorable right. or to do something harsher. Now, would that have to involve the, I, I've sat on two juries. Oh, lucky. Was, yeah. I've never been called for yeah. jury service. And I was told scientists never get picked, and yet I still got picked. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how that worked. And luckily, they were both interesting, both short. But I would assume, so in that case, the judge presided over the case and yes. the sentencing. So to do something like you said, it would have to be two different judges, I imagine. Be, exactly. Yeah. It would have okay. to be two. Or, or if a mm -hmm. defendant already pled guilty and is only right. coming and to the judge so. for sentencing, See. then that. Yeah. So are there other areas like, as, is there ways you can help when you're instructing a jury yes. to do things? Because that was I thought that was always key. Our, our, our instructions that we got seemed to play a big Absolutely. role. Absolutely. And this group that I was talking about in Seattle, what we've done is we drafted a series of jury instructions to give to jurors that explain what implicit bias is um, and that gives them uh, techniques to use when they're in their jury deliberations. So we're about to actually do a study. A UCI professor okay. is going to do a study on some of these jury instructions to, to, to see if they work or not. We also have a jury orientation video that we've created. So when everyone's sitting there getting, like you've done this right. now, right? Yes, so exactly. when you sit there and you're just watching <laughs> this video, you're waiting to get yeah. called, right? Now there's a very yeah. short but entertaining video that we've created that will educate you in three minutes or less okay. about unconscious bias and the way it might influence your judgments in a case. And so we're testing uh, that out too, but it's being used in, in courtrooms in uh, Washington State now. Awesome. Now, 
again, switching to something, taking this and applying it into the teaching area that I do. You know, one of the things we're trying to start out of our office, mm -hmm. um, we've had our first pilot workshop a few weeks ago on race and culture in the science classrooms. Oh, and we'd like to, we're going to be rolling this out to the whole campus, doing some other Great. things. Great. Oh, I would and, love to yeah. learn more about this. And so I think one of the ideas is for faculty, and there's two extremes, right? There's when you're teaching 400 students and you feel like everyone's anonymous. <laughs> Right, that's true. Right. But, but even there, I know they're not really. Yes. Right, things happen, students come to office hours, you right. get to know some students, right. not others. Students yes. maybe sit in the front of the that's room. Right. Yep. There's certain things. Um, and then the classes get smaller. I mean, yes. despite some stereotypes, we don't have just 400 person classes here at UCI. We have a lot of smaller <laughs> ones. Um, if you were to give sort of one or two pieces of advice to faculty, mm -hmm. what are some of the things they can think about, do, to just help start mitigating these unconscious biases as they teach. So one is just being aware of it. Okay. That actually helps right. a lot, right? Because when you're aware of things, then you become more careful, and you gather more in, uh, you gather more information about people. And by yeah. gathering more information, you begin to treat people more as an individual. Um, yeah. Not multitasking, because when okay. you multitask, you're not paying attention, and then what does your brain do? It fills in the missing pieces, right? Okay. That's what it does. So taking time to get to know your students individually, one-on-one, -on -one, is one way to do it. And then, of okay. course, we do blind grading, which is fantastic, right? Okay. That is yeah. one of the best ways to help us overcome any unconscious bias yeah. that we have. So as we move, so unconscious bias yes. and implicit bias, mm -hmm. Um, I find as a leader, <laughs> there are sometimes biases against us. Do you um, really find yes, that? What yes. type of bias have you well, found? You know, so far, thank goodness, people still recognize that I'm a faculty, um, <laughs> right? But there is this sense of administrators are somehow against the good of students oh, and the university, right? And faculty care about the students in the university. Yes. Um, and one thing I like about the UC system and UCI is how strongly we have this faculty administrator model, right? right? that we draw from. But you're in an interesting, unique position as a leader, I would argue, which is the second um, dean of the law school following, let us say, uh, someone who was liked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes yes. following someone who was disliked is not as challenging. <laughs> right? But, right? But worse, you're following the founding dean, right? You know, and so mm -hmm. I could imagine there's pressures, but there's also benefits to that. Mm -hmm. So just kind of curious your your take on being the, the second dean. Uh, sure. So so first of all, Erwin Chemerinsky is such an incredible friend. Right. Um, so he's, he's been an incredible support system uh, to the law school, to right. me. He cares so much about it. And what's so wonderful about that is that he's built a strong foundation at UCI. Right. Um, and so the law school is already starting from a great place. Uh, that, which means for me, now I have the pleasure of taking something that's already incredible and making it even more so. Right. Uh, so I, of course, I think any second leader at the beginning has to feel some sort of <laughs> pressure, <Right. laughs> um, potentially. Yeah. Um, but, but much of that, I think, is now dissipated. Um, right. And now it's really yeah. the excitement, right, of working yeah. with, with everyone at the law school to try to really um, think about our vision for the future. Where is it that we're going? How do we keep up our current trajectory and get even better than we are yeah. now? Um, how do we continue to do the impossible, really? Because we did the, Irwin did the impossible right. when he started this new law school, yeah. and we want to continue to do that into the future. So what are some of the you know, exciting things that you find? So I'll tell for, for me, I was both, I really was pleasantly surprised that um, how much opportunity being at this level gives you mm -hmm. to shape things yes. and to work with people and to help people kind of realize visions they have yes. for units. Um, and so there was a lot of little surprises for me. And so to put some pressure on you, like what were some of the <laughs> surprises or exciting things you found that like keep you energized and, and, and still wanting mm -hmm. to do this? I think there, there are a number of different right. uh, surprises, and I, I think the first surprise really is that I would like this job because yes. I actually <laughs> didn't I, want I didn't want this job, <laughs> right? And so yeah. I, I was convinced to be the interim, and I realized being the interim that what I imagined a job to be and what it actually is is very different. Yes. Uh, so once I realized what the job actually is, which is 
motivating people, right? Figuring out what excites them. How yes. do you multiply their talents, right? And so that we can all work together to create something bigger than each of us are individually. Once I realized that was a job, I just loved it. And because now it just frees you up to work with your colleagues yeah. to imagine a future and then put the pieces in place to make that future happen, right? Wow. And, and so that's what's so empowering about it and yeah. exciting about it, right? So that, that's sort of the big picture view of why I love this job and, and the people I, that you I know, work I don't with. Think, I don't think I could say it better. That's kind of resonates so well with mm -hmm. my experience is discovering that aspect of it yes. and what it really is. Right, right. Is so it's just, not really about you. Right? No, it's, it's not. It's about the institution. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, what yeah. I, that's what I love about it. Yeah. Um, and, it actually reminds me of being a lawyer with a client, right? Except this is the law school. The law school is my client. And yeah, no, that's amazing. I feel the same way. People ask me, oh, how did you feel like your research is less and you have to maybe give that up? And I'm like, no, the university is now my research. Right, exactly. Right, it's, that's it's, exactly right. it's this whole new thing and I can make amazing things happen for other people. I also kind of joke, I know the worst thing they can do to me is make me a physics professor again. So, you know, which was <laughs> so not a bad thing. this job then, so right? Like, but, but, and the other piece of it is, I, I think, you know, at some point I will step down and be a faculty again. Right. And so I just keep in mind, I don't want to do anything that would create a university I don't want to be a professor at. Right, that's, <laughs> right, you know, that's a good which point. Is, that's a good point, because you still are a member of the faculty. You right? are. And a member of this community. And, and, and it keeps me so grounded cool. and keeps me... Absolutely. You know, doing things. Absolutely. Well, that is amazing. We are so lucky to thank, have you. I am you. so lucky to be no, here. This is so amazing. Thank you. This has been great conversation. Thank have, you so much. I've had much. fun. Thank yes. you very much. So this has been Conversations with the Vice Provost. Thank you for watching. We look forward to having you come back for another video. Thanks for watching. This is the time where you get to be part of the conversation. Comment below. You know the drill. You know how to do that. Subscribe. Follow us. Look for us on all our social media and stay part of the conversations. Thank you.